Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hello, hello. I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program today. Speak English powerfully. Speak English fluently. Speak English effortlessly. Commit to my VIP program. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. And add my pronunciation course. That's a great, powerful combination. VIP program and the pronunciation course together at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. We are live today, live on Facebook video. Lots of people joining. We are finishing our most recent book, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, the Brazilian writer. Finishing this good book. Of course, we're reading the English version. The original version was in Brazilian Portuguese. Just want to welcome everybody. Hey, Fernanda, speaking of Brazil, we've got Brazilians joining us right now. We have people from all over the world. Hello, Nasser. Hey, Lisa, Hungary. Fantastic. Just lots of people saying hello, Asma and Egypt which is where our story is today in Egypt. Dominican Republic, Carmen, hey there. Lithuania, also Egypt, Iran, Thailand. Lots of hellos from lots of places, even England. See, even the English need to learn to speak English from me. <laughs> Just joking. Okay. Let's start, shall we? Let's just get going and start because we got the exciting conclusion, the exciting end to our story. As always, I'll summarize, I'll review what happens in the story, then I'll go back and I'll talk about the meaning, at least my opinion of the meaning, the messages in the story, give you my opinion about that, and then I'll go to our live Facebook audience of Effortless English family. And I think the most interesting part of these shows, I'll get your uh, comments and questions. You guys always have great comments and great questions both. So very good. So let's go. Let's get started, shall we? You'll remember. Santiago is now with the alchemist, right? He met the alchemist, the master alchemist at the Oasis. And the master alchemist is teaching him. And, um, you know, mostly the master alchemist is guiding him, helping him get to the pyramids. Right? They're already in Egypt and they're getting close to the pyramids. Remember last week we talked about there was the attack on the oasis. And Santiago, he had a vision, right? A dream about it. He knew it was coming. Kind of scary, but he told everybody what was happening. He saved everybody. He got a bunch of gold, but he also fell in love with a girl. And it was hard. Uh, he didn't know. Should he leave or should he stay, right? Should he stay in the oasis? He already has gold and he likes this girl. But finally, he decided and, you know, the alchemist encouraged him to, no, you need to go and finish, finish this journey you have started. This is an important journey. You need to finish it. Go all the way. You're almost there. Go. Keep going. So he leaves the girl behind and the alchemist and Santiago go into the desert. So that's where we start today. Okay, so we start and it says they cross the desert for two more days. The alchemist, who's the guide, right? The master, the older man, the alchemist, he's the guide. He knows the desert. And it says he becomes very cautious. He's very, um, being very careful 
because, you know, there's still a lot of fighting, remember, in the desert. There's different groups, different tribes, different groups are having a war, and they're fighting each other. There's a lot of dangerous, violent men around the desert at this time. It's a dangerous time to be traveling. But they try to be careful. They're going, and as they go, they start to have a talk. And um, the alchemist teaches Santiago a little more. Santiago is asking him questions and about, you know, how do I find wisdom? How do I find, uh, you know, treasure? How do I l become a better person? All of these kind of questions. And, you know, the alchemist is telling him to follow his heart, right? Meaning, you know, follow your deep, your deep intuition. You have to keep listening and it, it's, you got to keep listening. And that's important. It's a process of listening, listening, listening carefully to what's deep inside of you. And that's how you find your way. So the boy tries to do this. He keeps calling him the boy, but he's really a young man. Uh, Santiago, uh, you know, tries to listen to his heart. He starts, you know, this is kind of meditation he's teaching him in a way. Um, you know, listening to your heart means listening to your noticing, observing, you know, looking at and observing, watching your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings. That's what he's doing. This is a process of meditation. Okay. Then they have another discussion. And, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, to keep going. And the alchemist gives him a warning because, you know, again, Santiago, he keeps thinking about, you know, well, why, why keep going, right? This is kind of a big question for him now because really already Santiago, already he achieved, he achieved the material or the worldly or the outward goal. Right? He, he has everything he, he needs to be comfortable. He has a lot of gold he got in the oasis. So he has plenty of money now. He's rich. He has a girl that he loves and the girl loves him. He has the oasis. He likes the oasis. He could stay there. So he really has no external, right, outside reasons anymore. He doesn't, you know, he... The, remember the original idea, the original dream about the, the pyramids, it was because of a treasure, gold, money, but he doesn't need money now. So he's asking the alchemist these questions, you know, kind of, again, it keeps coming back. Well, why, why keep going? Why should I keep going now? I really, I have all that stuff. But, and of course the alchemist is trying to help him realize that, you know, your dream comes from, he calls it the soul of the world, the the soul or the spirit of the world, right? The spiritual world is what he's saying, right? It's kind of, and if you want to use a, a bigger word, you could say God, right? It's coming from something spiritual, something godly inside you or outside you. That's what that dream is about. And it's obviously not about money or just money or just a girl, right? It's something deeper, so you can't stop. Even though you have money now, even though you have love and you have money, you have all the external things you need now, but you can't stop. And he says this is dangerous because many people stop just before they succeed. It's that it's very tough. And the alchemist says every search begins with beginner's luck. And then every search ends, every big journey ends at the end. The victor, right? The, the, the searcher, the person is severely tested. It means you have a big, big, big test just before you achieve your purpose, your big, big, big uh, goal or journey. It's bigger than a goal, really. Right? So he's saying often at the beginning, you have good luck and everything seems easy. But at the end, just before you make it, it's the opposite. Often, just before the end, it's the toughest time. Okay, then Santiago, he remembers an idiom, a saying, an idiom, which is, which is an idiom from English. 
Maybe they have it in Spanish too. I don't know. But it says the darkest hour of the night is just before dawn. We say it's darkest just before dawn. Dawn is when the sun comes up. So it's darkest just before the sun comes up, sunrise. What does that mean? Of course, it means that everything can seem the most scary, the most terrible, the worst, just before it gets better, just before you have victory, just before you win, just before everything becomes much better. It seems terrible, terrible, terrible. So he's saying, don't quit now. Don't quit when it seems so terrible because you're so close to success. Okay. Next, things get dangerous. It says they're only two days away, two days from the pyramids. Only two more days. They're almost there. So we're going to see just what the alchemist was saying. Now it's going to happen. Because what happens is what? There's some soldiers, some fighters capture them right? They're only two days away from the pyramids. Almost two more days. Finally, he makes it. He gets the treasure, but so close. And then what happens? Some army captures them, right? These guys grab them. They have swords. They're scary guys. And they think they're spies. It's like, you're spies. You're spying for the other group. And so the, uh, these guys say, you're spies, right? And the alchemist, he's kind of smart, right? He's tricky. So the alchemist says, we're not spies. We're not spies. No, 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 we're not. We're not spies. Of course, they're not spies. So he says, well, you know, who are you? And he says, well, I'm just, I'm just, you know, a guide. I'm nobody. I'm just a guide. And then he says, well, you know, he says, but my friend, he's talking about Santiago. My friend is a great alchemist. Right. So the alchemist says, he doesn't say he's an alchemist. The alchemist says, oh, this guy, Santiago, he's the alchemist. He's a great, powerful alchemist. And he wants to show you, Santiago, he wants to show you his power, his magical power. Ah, so what's the alchemist doing, right? The alchemist is, he's, he's actually testing Santiago. He also says, um, you know, don't kill us. Don't kill us because we brought you gold. We brought you some money. Remember that Santiago has a lot of money. So now they have to use the money to save their lives. And he says, and don't make Santiago mad. Don't make this kid mad because he'll destroy all of you with his magical power, with the wind, the power of the wind. It will come in and destroy you all. Right. So, Santi of course, Santiago's thinking, what, what, what is he talking about? Why is he saying this? But they take they go to the leader of these men and the, the alchemist, the real alchemist. Tells the boss, the big boss tells him this story. They give the gold to this guy. So the guy says, OK, I won't kill you now since you gave me this gold. I won't kill you. And also, I'm curious. Right. I'm curious about this magic power. I want to see this. I want to see this boy, this kid, this young man. I want to see him bring the power of the wind. I want to see this great magical power. So, so, so because you gave me money, I will. You, you can live for three more days. I'll take your gold. So Santiago now has no money again. Uh, and you can live three days. But after three days, I'm going to kill you. Unless you show me this power, the magic power, you have to bring the wind. You have to bring this powerful wind like you promised. So it's a test. Okay, so now, of course, after they they walk away and of course, Santiago is not happy about this. He's really upset because he has no idea how to do it. He doesn't know how he doesn't know magic. He doesn't know how to call the power of the wind and he's really upset about to the alchemist like why did you tell him that why did you tell him i could do that right he's he's very upset about it as you can guess <laughs> and of course though this is a test the alchemist is testing him because the alchemist wants him to find this power the alchemist knows that santiago has really this one more step he has this one more big test and then he will be a master 
So the alchemist is doing this on purpose. He's testing Santiago. So he says, I have no idea how to turn myself into the wind. I don't know how to become the wind. I don't know how to call the wind. So the alchemist doesn't tell him very much, but he gives them this advice. This is what he says. He says, the world is only the visible aspect of God. So the world is, you know, part of God. It's, it's what we can see, right? It's there's a spiritual, something spiritual, something godly in all of the world. And what alchemy does, what, what our practice does, what you can, what alchemists do, is they bring the spiritual power into the regular world, right? They connect the two. Right? We have the normal world. We look like this microphone and we think there's nothing spiritual here. But he's saying, oh, there actually is. And the alchemists, they kind of make the connection. They, they find the spiritual power inside of everything. That's what you have to do. But of course, Santiago says, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? And he just says, you know, follow your heart. He, doesn't, he gives him no real advice. He doesn't tell him, you know, a magic spell. He just says, you know, follow your heart. <laughs> Basically meditate, right? Just meditate. And you know, it's a test, though. The alchemist is testing him. The alchemist wants him to find the answer himself. Right? The alchemist doesn't want to give him the answer. Santiago has to find this himself. He has to figure it out himself. And, of course, he has a strong motivation to do this because he's going to be killed if he doesn't do it. Okay, so finally, it's the third day. And the... All the big, all the fighters, you know, the tribe, the fighters come and the big boss, the chief, he comes and they all sit there and they say, okay, you, Santiago, do it. Go up on the top of that hill and call the wind. So Santiago is, you know, he's a little worried, but he, he, he goes up there. And this case, this is the part that's a little bit difficult to describe. So I'm going to describe what happens uh, in the story. Then when we come back, I'll tell you what I think it means because it's not completely obvious, the meaning. Okay, so Santiago goes up there and he has a, he kind of, basically he meditates, okay? He, he goes into kind of like a, some kind of meditation mindset, right? Where he, his mind becomes quiet and he can connect with the spirit of the desert, okay? The spiritual power of the desert. He somehow can connect and communicate with the desert. And he starts to have a conversation, probably not talking, probably really more inside his mind. And he starts talking to the desert. He says, um, you know, please help me. I need to call the wind. I need to call the wind. <sighs> And uh, the desert answers, well, why? Why should I help you? And he says, uh, because, I, because um, you, the desert, you have someone I love, right? The girl in the oasis. He says, in, the, the person I love is, you know, in the oasis. It's in, in the desert. It's part of your land. So please help me so I can go back to her. And... Uh, the desert says, well, what, what is love? I don't understand what is love, right? The desert's just kind of a spiritual power. Doesn't understand this kind of love, exactly. And um, and then they have this, they, the conversation's a little complicated. So I'm just going to make it very simple. So basically he says, well, um, I can help you understand love. I'll... Santiago says, I'll try to help you understand love, the feeling of love, if you help me create the wind. But the desert says, I can't really do that. I can help a little bit, but it's not my power. You have to talk directly to the wind, right? The spirit of the wind. You have to talk directly. So I'll introduce you, basically, okay? I'll introduce you. I'll connect you to the spirit of the wind. 
And so this is what happens next. A little bit of wind comes. A little wind comes. Kind of a light, small wind. It's the spirit of the wind. The spirit of the wind comes and joins them. And now the boy can talk to the spirit of the wind. And the boy says the same thing. Help me. Please help me, spirit of the wind. Because um, because there's someone I love, I lo the, the person I love, and um, you, the wind, the air, you carry my voice to her. It's very romantic, right? It's the, when I say I love you, you know, it, the sound of my voice goes across the wind to her. So wind, you are, you know, you carry my love. You carry my voice to the person I love. Because of that, please help me. And um, the wind is very curious. But the wind also doesn't quite understand this idea of love. But the wind's curious, like, well, that's interesting. Um, I'd like to learn more about this this love stuff what we call love and the boy tries to explain love he says when you are loved you can do anything when you are loved um you know you, you completely open your heart um he tries to explain but the wind really doesn't understand and um the wind says well maybe you know you need to talk to the sun because the wind starts blowing stronger and stronger, but the wind still doesn't understand and the, the wind does, can't get enough power. And uh, the wind basically says, well, it, let's talk to the sun. Let's all, you know, the, the, the desert and the wind. Let's talk to the sun because the sun has even more power, right? The sun is more powerful, more intelligent, Maybe the sun can help explain love to us and help us understand. And so the wind starts to blow very, very strong to try to make a big sandstorm and go all the way up to the sun. So, of course, this is what's happening inside the boy's mind. But on the outside, on the outside, the other people, right, the fighters, the, the, the chief, the leader of the, the men, they just see that the wind is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So they, they see like, oh my God, it's working. This, this uh, guy, he's calling the wind. It's some kind of magical power because they can't hear what's happening. They can't hear the boy talking to the spirits. They just see that the wind is getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So they think it's just magic. So they go to the sun now. And um, he talks to the sun next. And the sun says, so the wind told me, right? The wind introduced me. And the wind says that you know about love. Santiago, you know about love. Interesting. And he says, if you know about love, you must know about the soul of the world. Again, the spirit of the whole world. And the sun says, I can see because I'm up in the sky, high, high in the sky. I'm closer. So I can see the soul of the world, right? The spirit of God really is what it's talking about. So the soul said, the, the sun says, I learn love from the spirit of the world. That's where I learn to love. And because I love I love everyone on earth. I love the earth. I love all of the creatures on earth. Because of that, I take care of everyone on earth, right? I give my energy, the sun's energy, I give it to the earth so they can live. I know I don't go too close. If I go too close, I will burn the earth. Everyone will die. If I am too far, everyone will become cold and they will die. So I'm just right. I'm right in the middle. I give them exactly what they need, everybody on earth. I give everything they need to use my energy and to live a good life. That's love. That's what the sun says. And so the boy kind of says, yes, I understand. I understand. I, now I know about this. 
But then the boy says, you don't know completely about love. He says, that's, he says, that is a kind of love, but, um, The problem is that the reason that you, the son, the reason you don't know everything about love is because your kind of love stays the same, right? The son is always the same, comes up and goes down, comes up, goes down, basically always the same. And he says, but real, the deepest love will change you. The deepest love will make you become a better person. It changes you into something else, something much higher, something much better. That's the most powerful love of all. And you, the son, you don't know about that, right? Santiago says this. And so at this point, the boy, uh, the son says, well, really? Hmm, that's interesting. We need to talk to the soul of the world. We need to talk to God now, right? We have to, if I don't, because the son says, I don't know if you're right or not. So let's talk to the soul of the world. Let's go all the way to the top and let's, See if you are correct. Let's see if you understand correctly, Santiago. And so they do. The son connects Santiago to the soul of the world. And he sees the soul. He sees that the soul of God was his own soul. Right? That he has a, that he, he finally gets this connection directly with God. Right? With the grand, the highest spiritual force. And at this point, the boy truly understands, right? He gains wisdom. He gains understanding. He gains the understanding that everything in the world, including himself, comes from that spirit of, you know, the soul of the world, the soul of God, that it all comes from that, and we all return to that. So that's what's happening inside his mind. Now, on the outside, the soldiers... The, the guys, the fighters, they just see the wind become super, super, super strong. It becomes so strong that the sand is blowing and everybody becomes really scared and they, they believe him. They say, oh my God, this, this guy, this kid, this young man, he's a, he's a magician. He's got this incredible power. And so finally they say, stop, stop, enough, enough. We believe you. We won't kill you. We believe you. But Santiago knows that it's not, he doesn't have the power. It's not from him. The power only comes from God. But, but the guys in the, you know, the guys watching this don't completely understand that. This is the big message. This is the, the right here. This is the, the peak, the top. We might call, in English, we call the climax of the story. This, this is the real treasure, and Santiago just got it. Santiago just got the real treasure. The story will continue, we'll see, but in fact, this is the real treasure. This is what he needed to learn. This is really what the journey is about. This is the journey. He needed to not just learn in his mind, not just read in a book, but he needed to directly feel and experience and directly connect with that soul, the spirit of God, and he needed to understand, to experience it, right? Not just, not just the idea, but a direct experience. That's the real treasure. That's the whole point. That's the real, real purpose, the deep purpose of this whole dream, the whole journey, everything that he's been doing. That This is it right here. So he does it. The storm, finally the storm goes away. And uh, uh, they say, okay, you know, we believe you. You can go. They let him go. So the alchemist and uh, uh, Santiago continue. They, they leave and they continue walking towards the pyramids. Now, of course, Santiago, this is a huge thing, right? This is a big experience he just had. So he's not quite fully understanding it yet, right? He still has, to, he needs to kind of think about this for a, for a little while. It's, it's such a big experience, you know, it's kind of overwhelming experience. So he's, he's kind of quiet for a while and they just keep walking. They get, they go to a monastery, a Christian monastery. And they're only one day away. 
one day from the pyramids now. It's called Coptic. Coptic is an old Egyptian, you know, group uh, of Christians. So they go to this Christian monastery and uh, they meet the monk. And at the monastery, the alchemist finally makes gold. He actually goes, he goes into their kitchen, basically, goes to the kitchen, he gets some metal, and he does a bunch of stuff, and he makes gold. He makes a big piece of gold. And uh, he says, he kind of laughs, he just says, oh, I wanted to show you that I can really do this. I wanted to show you this is really, you know, this is not a magic trick. It's really possible. I really can do it. So he makes a big piece of gold. He cuts it. He gives one piece to uh, the monk. He said, this, this is for your church. Um, you know, please take care of people. And the monk says, oh, thank you so much. It's really nice. It's too much. And he says, no, no, never say that. Just accept generously. And um, then he gives half of it um, to the boy. So he gives um, one fourth, 25%, he gives to the boy immediately. The other 25%, he gives to the monk. He says, save this for Santiago. Save this for Santiago. Because um, Santiago, he's always losing money, basically, right? So he might find his treasure. Then he might lose it again. Maybe he's going to need money again. So if Santiago, if he comes back here to the mo monastery, if he comes back with no money, please give him this, uh, this gold because he's always losing money. Okay, so that's it. And that is all. Now, the alchemist says, now you must go the last day by yourself. You must go alone. The final part of the journey, you must do yourself. So the, the alchemist says, you know, good luck to you. And the alchemist um, says, goodbye. And the boy says, goodbye. And he goes, and he finally, Santiago goes, and he sees the amazing, the great pyramids of Egypt. He, dun, 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 he sees them. And they're amazing, of course. They're huge. And he starts looking around, and he's trying to remember his dream, and he's thinking, well, where's my treasure? Where should I look? And he sees a, a beetle, you know, a bug, right? And the bug is kind of digging in the dirt, and he says, ah, it's a sign. It's another omen. It's a sign. That's where my treasure is. So he starts digging where the beetle is. He's digging in the dirt, digging a hole, digging a hole, digging a hole. And he thinks, I'm going to find gold. Finally, I'll find it. But then while he's digging, um, some men, some men come up to him, they, some bad men. And they see him digging and they say, what are you doing? And they grab him. And they look in his bag and they find some gold. They say, ah, gold. And they steal his gold. They take his gold from his bag. And um, they said, what are you doing? Tell us what you're doing or we're going to kill you, right? And they, they kind of take out their knives, right? They're going to kill him. So they steal the gold that he got just got. He just got it yesterday from the alchemist. And the alchemist was right. He lost it already. So they take that. And then they say, we're going to kill you unless you tell us what you're doing. And uh, he he doesn't lie, so he just tells the truth. He says, I'm digging for my treasure. I'm digging for my treasure. He says, I had a dream. I had a dream when I was in Spain. I, I was in Spain. I had a dream. If I came to the pyramids and if I would dig, that I would find a treasure. And uh, the leader of the thieves, this bad guy, he, he starts laughing. He laughs and he says, oh, God, you're an idiot. This kid, he's like, ah, he tells the other men, ah, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't have any more money. He's, he's stupid. He thinks he's going to find gold in the ground. This guy's, in, this guy's stupid. So they all start leaving. But right as they're leaving, the leader talks to Santiago. He says, he says, I'm, he says you're too stupid to kill. He says, look, you're an idiot. I had a, a very, I had the same kind of dream two years ago. Two years ago, I had a dream that 
under a tree, a sycamore tree in Spain next to a church that I would find, if I dug, it, dug there in the ground, I would find gold. But I'm, I'm smart. I'm not going to travel all the way to Spain just to dig in the hole and get the treasure there. That's stupid. You're too, you're stupid. And then he leaves. And of course the boy realizes, aha, he just told me where the treasure is. That's where the treasure really is. The treasure is actually all the way. It's back in Spain because the boy realizes, I know that church. I know exactly the tree he's talking about. I know exactly where he's talking about. This guy had a dream about where the treasure is exactly, and he just told me. Now I just need to go home, and I'll get it. All right, the last part. So, of course, he goes all the way back to Spain. We, we, it's very quickly. He, they don't really talk about it in the story. But he goes all the way back to Spain, and he digs next to that tree back in Spain at the church, and he, does, he finds it. It's a huge box of gold coins and also nice stones like emeralds and diamonds. He's super, super rich. So he had to go all the way back home, and it was there all the time. So he gets all that money and gold. Now he's super, super, super rich. And then what does he do? He says, well, now I'm going to go to, now he's going to go back to the girl that he loves, Fatima. He's going to go back to the oasis and live there with this girl, get married. And that is the end. That's the end of our story. Let's go back and talk about the meaning of the story. My opinion about the meaning. Uh, the part with the magic and the wind and all that is um, it's a little difficult to understand the meaning, honestly. I mean, I had to think, I've been thinking a lot about it for a week. Like, what is Coelho's message in this section? I honestly think, I don't know, it's, it's not my favorite section, honestly, but uh, we'll talk about it, and I'll give you my opinion. Okay, here we go. Back to the beginning of this section. They talk about following your heart. So they're, they're, they're walking across the desert. They're having the conversation. How do you know? How do you find wisdom? How do you know what to do in life? How do you find your purpose? Right? Big questions. We all ask these questions. Good questions. And he says, follow your heart. How do I follow my heart? What does that mean? And basically, he said, you've got to listen very carefully to you know, your thoughts, uh, your feelings, all these things very, very carefully and deeply, which is basically meditation. He's basically saying you meditate. I mean, this is what meditation is. People, you know, one kind of meditation is you sit and you just focus on your breathing. And that's all. But, and people think that, I mean, a lot of people think that's the only kind of meditation, but that's really the first step of meditation. And when you do that, just by focusing on your breathing, you will naturally be realize that you're thinking, you're, all your little thoughts will be popping up all the time. And you'll start to notice the thoughts that come again and again and again and again and again. And the next deeper level of meditation is you, you watch those thoughts. You watch the feelings. You'll, you'll, you'll get feelings in your body. You'll get emotions coming up as you sit there just breathing. And you start to look at them and notice them. And you start to learn about yourself and you learn about your deeper feelings, your deeper thoughts. As your mind becomes more and more quiet, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is how you find that intuition, that wisdom. So he's describing actually a very old way of finding wisdom, meditation. Next, we get a message. We talked about the same message last week. The idea that we are often tested, right? Especially at the end of our journey, as we're getting close to a big goal, a big something really big that's very meaningful, 
that often it will feel very difficult near the end. There's a big test near the end. Last week, I gave the example, you're running a marathon, right? Well, usually a marathon feels very easy at the beginning. You feel fresh. But the last part of the marathon, the last 30 minutes, can feel miserably difficult. <laughs> you're tired. Your feet hurt. Your legs hurt. You have no energy. You are exhausted. Everything feels terrible. It's a big test at the end. This often happens in life. Not always, but often. It's often darkest before the dawn, indeed. Okay, next, the climax of the story. This is where we're going to learn a few new words today. <clears throat> I'm just going to skip right to the end of this and talk about my opinion. Okay, right there. All right, my opinion about this. Change the video to... I think... I've been think, trying to think about how to describe the message of, you know, the wind, his magic trick. It's not really a magic trick, but, but you know, him calling the wind and all this and this conversation he has with these different spirits. And I think the word baraka, baraka, uh, describes this very well. Now, this is originally an Arabic word. It comes from Arabic. Uh, we have it in English. You can find it in an in English dictionary. However, it's not a common word, okay? So if you use this word, if you, with, um, I don't know, Americans, Brits, Australians, uh, many will not know this word, okay? It's not a common word. But I think it's the perfect word to describe this, what Coelho is talking about. And I think this is possibly where Coelho gets this idea. For, you know, this whole section, I think, comes from the idea of Baraka, especially because this story is uh, happening in Egypt, right? It's happening uh, in, in uh, this sort of uh, setting. So I think Baraka. What is Baraka? Baraka, the, a more common English word is grace. So uh, baraka is an Arab, like I said, an Arabic word, and it means it's like the the spirits that it, the spirit of God or or the spiritual power in the normal world, in the regular world, right? It could be in people, and it can be in even in things, objects, right? But it's this idea. This it's like a like you could think of it as a a, a bridge or a a river of you know spiritual power connecting all the way to God and then coming down you know into us into into the wind into the sun into this this desk right into the world and there's an idea especially um, like in Islam especially in the, the Sufi kind of Islam S U F I of of you know sort of connecting with this spiritual power. And I believe that's what Coelho is describing. I believe that's what Santiago is doing in this part of the story. He's learning how to do that, how to find the spiritual power in the regular world, the desert. I mean, the desert is, if we just look at the desert, it's just sand, right? But there's something deeper there. It's not just sand, right? Right. There's something, there's a spiritual power there. It comes from, everything comes from God, ultimately. Right? The wind, same thing. The wind, oh, it's just uh, wind blowing on my face. No, it's something more than that. There is a spiritual power within the wind. The sun, again, the same thing. And so what he does is, he's, uh, you know, in his mind, in, a, in kind of using a kind of meditation, Santiago is connecting with and finding that spiritual power first in the desert then the wind then in the sun and then finally he connects directly to that highest spiritual power which in english common english would be the most common word in english would be god you know as i've said in my audio podcast there are many different names you know muslims would say allah and hindus might say brahman and, uh, you know, Buddhists might say Nirvana or Dharmakaya. 
uh, Christians would say God. Um, Tao is a Chinese word. But we'll just let's use Baraka here, because I think Baraka is uh, is is really what he's describing, because it's a combination of the spiritual and the material of the the regular world of like physics and chemistry and science, you know, and then the spiritual world. And it's that connection between the two. That's the secret of the alchemist. That's the true secret of the alchemist. That's what the master work, the, the, the true goal of the alchemists, the real alchemists, is to find that spiritual power in the regular world. And that's the real treasure that Santiago finds. And what's interesting is, you know, the real treasure is that. He finds his real treasure right here. And, we, and here is where we realize, where we can clearly see that the gold, the box of gold, it's, it's the external goal. But it's not the true treasure. And it's nice. It was motivating for him, especially in the beginning. It was motivating for him. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, you could think of it in a way that, that spirit or God or intuition was uh, using the gold to bring him to the higher purpose, the more important purpose, which is this baraka. Like I said, now the more common word in English, uh, instead of baraka, most people won't know that word, but they will know the word grace. And grace has a similar idea. Grace is a blessing or a gift from God. Okay, it's a blessing or a gift from God, like a spiritual blessing. That's probably the closest common English word I can think of. I think most Christians would probably use that word grace. Um, that's the true treasure that he finds. So really after this, you know, most stories, there's a climax and there's a little drop at the end. Well, it's the same with this story. That's really the climax, but now he still is, he's still going to finish it. He's still going to get that external goal. And uh, we'll talk about this in a second. But next, so he goes to the pyramids, finally. You know, they go to the monks, the monastery. Uh, the alchemist makes a little more gold. It's kind of a light section there. And then he goes to the pyramid. And here we get another little message. So he goes to the pyramid. He makes it, right? We're, we're, we're expecting he's going to dig a hole. He, he'll find the box of gold. But that doesn't happen. What happens? He digs a hole and there's nothing. He finds nothing at all. Nothing, nothing. Just a bug. <laughs> but then what happens? <laughs> then the guys, the thieves, right? The bad guys come and they steal his little bit of gold that he had. And they... They say, we're going to kill. They threaten to kill him. Um, and he says, oh, I'm digging for treasure. And then they laugh at him. And then the thief, the number one thief, the, the top guy laughs and then tells him, oh, I had a similar dream about a treasure in Spain. And this is the boy. He comes all the way to Egypt just to learn that the treasure is actually back at his house, back at his home in Spain, not his house, but his his home. It's all the way back where he used to be, right back where he started, which is an interesting message, and we're going to talk about that. So, right? Because we got to think now. Well, there's a couple interesting messages. These are very, this is very traditional storytelling, by the way. You'll find this message in a lot of stories, traditional stories. So there's the idea that number one, to find the treasure, to find the wisdom, to grow, to learn, Number one, he, he had to leave his home, even though the box is back in Spain. So why did he have to go? Why did he go to Egypt? You know, why did he, the dream, let's say the dream came from, uh, you know, his spirit inside, or you, we could say maybe the dream came from, you know, the sp spirit outside. But either way, why? Why did he dream to go all the way to Egypt? Why not dream about directly? Oh, the gold's right here in the church, right under my feet in Spain. Right? Why? Well, because it's not the real goal. If, if he dreamed that the gold was in Spain in the beginning, 
right? No risk, no learning, no journey. He would just, oh, next day he would go and dig it up and that he had, and then suddenly he has a lot of money. But he would have none of the experiences, none of the learning, none of the problems, none of the challenges. He would not have met any of those people. Right? It just would have been super easy. He has a dream. Oh, there's gold right here in this church. Walk over, dig it up. He gets it. The end. Right? So this again shows us the goal, the real purpose is not that money. If the purpose was just money, then he would have dreamed, oh, well, the money's right here. There's no need for all of that other stuff. But, you know, we know, right, just by finishing this story, we can clearly understand why that's not good, right? He would, he would be rich, but he would be the same person he was before, right? He would have no knowledge, no wisdom, never would have met Fatima, never would have learned how to sell or do anything in the crystal shop, never would have met the alchemist, never would have learned about Baraka, Grace, never would have learned that true purpose. He had to leave home. It was necessary for him to leave home. Not only that, it was necessary to make the entire journey. The journey was the purpose, not the end, right? Not the end point. Gold was not. It's the whole journey is the real purpose. I mean, we can think of another example. What if he dreamed about, you know, he dreamed there's treasure in Egypt. Let's say this story happens right now, 2018. So he has a dream. Ah, there's gold in Egypt. So then he just, uh, he says, ah, I'll take a vacation. I'll, I'll, and he just, uh, he sells a couple sheep. He buys a plane ticket, a budget airline ticket, flies to Cairo one day and then comes back to Spain two days later. Right? Same problem. There's no journey. There's no challenge. No learning. Right? That, that also, that's, that would not be a satisfying, a meaningful journey. So once again, it's not just go there, get the money, and come back. Right? He needed every step. Every step was important, not just the last one. That's a big, important message. Now, another message we get is about faith because, um, you know, the thief, the thief in Egypt, he had a dream too. He had the same dream. He dreamed there was money, gold, in Spain. The thief, he could have done the same thing as Santiago. He could have gone on a journey. He could have stopped being a bad guy, stopped being a thief. He could have left Egypt and traveled across the desert all the way to Spain. And maybe he would have learned so many things and changed and become a much better person. And maybe he would have found the gold in Spain or maybe not. But he never tried. He just said, oh, that's a stupid dream. He did not have faith. He did not trust his intuition. He did not meditate. He did not think about it. He just continued to do the same old thing, being a bad guy. He learned nothing, and so he gained nothing. And then finally, the end, which we know. He goes, he gets the money, the end. All right, so I think those are the major messages, right, that we can see that, and I think we can easily see this in life then, right, that... We get too focused in our modern world. Um, ah, there were two two sayings I wanted to talk about before. Then we'll go to questions in a minute and comments. Uh, there's two idioms in English that are kind of the opposite, but I think they show what Coelho's telling us here. Um, the first one, the older idiom, is this. Here it is in English. It's not how. Mm, it's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. This is a, these are sports idioms. These are about sports. So it's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. This is the old idiom. So it's saying it's not, it's not so important if you win or lose a game. 
you know, let's say football or basketball. Winning and losing is not the most important thing. How you play, that's what's most important. That's the alchemist message. That's the Coelho's message. That's the spiritual message. The opposite message, which is the modern, the more modern message, the more popular one now, is, is this. Winning is everything. Winning is everything. This is the attitude. You'll hear this. A lot of uh, coaches, professional sports coaches, football, American football, or soccer too, right? They'll say, winning is everything. Winning is everything. So these are opposite mindsets. Winning is everything means the goal. The goal, the final goal. That's all that's important. It doesn't matter how you win. It doesn't matter how you do it. Just winning is the most important thing. Don't lose. That's what's important. And of course, these people are getting paid lots of money. So we understand why they have that mindset. But it's a foolish mindset. It's not a spiritual mindset at all. The other one, it's how you play the game is the most important. Not winning, not losing. How you play the game. That's the message Coelho is giving us here, right? It's the journey that's important. How you play the game means... You know, how you do it, the whole journey, if we're talking about sports, it's the whole thing, how you practice, how you think, the teamwork, how you're playing in the game, how do you handle difficulties, how do you handle losing, right? How do you deal with it? How do you handle winning? How do you handle losing? All of that together, who you become, right? It's the challenge of the, the sport and the kind of person you become doing it. That's what's important. And that's the older and much wiser message, which I agree with. Winning is everything that yeah, it doesn't matter. Cheat doesn't matter. Go ahead, cheat. If you can cheat and win, then do it. That's the, the mindset, right? That mindset says, oh, it doesn't, just the gold. The gold's the only thing that's important. You don't need this long journey of learning and problems and all of that. Right? This is kind of a battle. One is very shallow. Just get the money. And the other is, it's the wisdom that's important. It's the whole thing. All right. That's enough of me uh, and my ideas. I think it's time to go to the comments and questions, as usual. Because oftentimes, it's our members who have a lot of the very interesting thoughts and ideas. All right, a little bit of water. Let's go. Ah, Vladislav with a very nice comment. Um, a very modern version of this idea. The closer you get to the goal, the more difficult it becomes. Games also teach this. Ah, let's assume a video game has 15 levels. The first level is easiest. The second is more difficult, but still quite easy. But when you've completed number 14, 14 levels, you're one level from victory. You have to complete the 15th level, which is the hardest in the game. Very, very difficult. Yes. Vladislav is exactly right. Now, why do they do that? Think about this. Right? There's something deeper there. Even though it's just a video game, right? Maybe you're just killing zombies or something. Seems like it's not so deep. But there's actually a little bit of a deep purpose and message there or deep uh, idea there. Why do game designers do that? Because that's the most satisfying for players. I mean, imagine what if they did the opposite for players, right? You get a new video game and level one is super, 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 super difficult. It's the most difficult level. And then they get easier each level. Most players would not like it. Right. A lot of players would quit immediately because it's too tough in the beginning. It's just it seems impossible. You're not ready. You have no experience. You can't handle that super difficult level. Like I, I, I'm that way. I play video games. Not much, you know, very rarely. Every few months I'll play a few video games. So even normal video games, 
often are too difficult for me. But um, And I'll get very frustrated if I try to play a game and the first level is already too difficult and I'm just dying and dying and dying. And I'll, ah, I just changed to a different game. It's no fun, right? But the opposite's true also, especially with more experienced gamers, video gamers. They get good, so level one is easy for them. Well, it becomes boring, right? Level one is now boring for them. It's just too easy. They need more challenge. Their brain needs more challenge to enjoy the game. If it's too easy, it's not enjoyable because they're not learning. They're not, being, they're not having to get better at all. So the next level must be more difficult. So they, the next level is more difficult, more problems. But then finally, you know, they die, they die, they die, but then they get better and now they complete level two. Well, on to level three and four and five and six, right? Each level getting more and more tough. It has to be this way, even in something like a video game. Well, this is also true spiritually. That's what Coelho is telling us. This is true in life in general. It's like something you could say that our brains are programmed this way. You could say that there's some spiritual force or something in life that seems programmed this way. It just seems this is what we need, right? And so that's why challenge is not a bad thing. Difficulty is not a bad thing. In fact, it's necessary. If everything is too easy, you will become very, very bored, even with something like a video game, but also with life. Nice comparison. I like it. Cleefy with a nice comment. One message. We need to surround ourselves with wise and positive persons who push us and encourage us to never give up. Excellent point. You know, Santiago in this story, he constantly meets people who encourage him in different ways, right? You know, the gypsy encourages him. Yeah, go do it. Your dream is real. The king in Spain, the, you know, the magic kind of guy, he encourages him. Uh, the crystal shop owner helps him and supports him. Uh, you know, the girl he meets, Fatima, she encourages him to keep going. And then, of course, finally, the alchemist. So that's right. And that's we need that. We all need that. We all need help, right? Santiago doesn't do it all alone. It's not like he's just super, super strong and he can do everything all by himself and he can figure out everything by himself and he never needs help. No, he, he needs help. And several times during the story, he needs help. He needs advice. The Englishman helps him, right, in a way, introduces him to the books, encourages him to read the books and learn about alchemy. I mean, all these people help him and encourage him in different ways. We all need that. You're right. So, you know, we need to choose people who will do that. Because, of course, in life, there are other kinds of people who do the opposite, who hold us back. They pull us back. They discourage us. And we don't need those people. Those people, life will give us enough problems. We need people who will encourage us and also we should help other people too right so encourage people yourself farshid with a good comment relating this to english i do know the further you go the harder it gets every aspect of life seems to be a test for us of course learning english is not different once you get to the intermediate level it suddenly appears to be super hard and only those who are patient and have a strong determination can hope for the resonance of success, right? That highest level of success. That's true. It does. Because now, you know, the reason is, as you're getting to those advanced levels, you're now trying to get, you know, total mastery. You're, you're, you're now focused on the most difficult skills. You know, you're, you're trying to learn uh, a lot of vocabulary that's not, common that's less common you're trying to uh, work on small points of pronunciation which are possibly quite difficult you know so the those advanced levels they do become more difficult it's true and Cleefy is confirming again baraka is an arabic word he's got a link here means God's gift. Yes. Which, uh, like I said, I think the common English word might be grace. Not graceful, that's an adjective. Grace, the noun. 
Now, grace has a couple meanings. Grace can also mean like um, kind of moving in a beautiful way. That's one meaning of grace. But grace also has a spiritual meaning, which is more like baraka, like a spiritual gift from God. Beauty, spiritual beauty, that kind of thing. Okay, Iman Rajab says, uh, I'm from Jordan. I'm very impressed with how you teach. I hope all teachers follow you and learn the real way of learning. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Ciao from Italy, from Claudio. Hey there. From Moscow, from Vasily. Vasily. Uh, Asma, nice comment. Everything inside you, you should have to believe in yourself and trying to do it. Just keep going and doing it. Yes. And Nasser with an, another nice comment. There's always something spiritual connected to any situation or test for Santiago. It's not just treasure or money. That's exactly correct. And that's quite obvious, I think, in this book. I think that is exactly, you know, this book is very obviously a book about, you know, spiritual ideas. You know, Coelho is very open, very direct about that. You know, some books, this kind of message is, uh, is softer. It's less direct. But Coelho's not, <laughs> okay? With Coelho, it's very obvious and very direct that he's. this is not just an adventure story, okay? You, in fact, I would say Coelho probably doesn't care much about the adventure part of the story because he doesn't describe it in much detail. He really doesn't seem to care that much about it. Coelho is completely focused on the spiritual messages of this book. God loves your soul, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes, says Mohi. Uh huh. Ah, thank you. Crow says, I'm watching from Morocco, and your live streaming is amazing and attractive. It allows me to practice and improve my English confidence. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Ong says, uh, on the way to your dreams, we must be totally independent and self-reliant, mustn't we, AJ? Uh, I want to run a business by my own, but even my family members don't believe in it. What should I do, AJ? Ah, okay. Well, this is, you know, basically this is saying, well, what if, what if, um, what if you don't have the support? We just mentioned the importance of support. Um, what if you're, the people around you are not supporting that dream that you have? Well, then you need to find other people who will, or you just do it yourself. You know, I just did it myself, honestly. I didn't have a lot of uh, my dream of uh, traveling and my dream of starting my own business. I didn't have a lot of people around me encouraging me. Now, luckily, no one discouraged me. No one told me not to do it, but nobody... And basically, nobody really cared either way, <laughs> okay? So I was kind of on my own. It was up to me. So sometimes you just have to do it yourself. You just have to do it yourself. Just have faith in yourself and faith that it will be okay and just go forward and do it. And maybe later you meet people who will help you and encourage you. If not, you know, if you can't find people directly, you can read books, you can find people online, I mean, that's we have a great online community here with Effortless English. You can find other ways to support yourself and to get that support, to get the encouragement, to get the ideas. You just have to do it yourself. That's okay. That works. It, I did it successfully. It might be a little slower, but it still works. Okay, Miriam says, this is one of my favorite books. Good morning from France. Good morning to you, Miriam. And Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Okay, Basilio saying hello. Hi, Basilio. Ciao. 
Shara, hello. Thanks to you too. Okay. Let me move forward a little bit. Okay, here we go. Lisa with a nice long comment. Santiago's story is essentially the story of mankind, humankind. Uh, it's about decision making. It's about following your dreams. It's choosing to live a life that gives your heart and soul meaning and purpose. It's about finding your true self, your mission, your personal legend. Yes, fantastic summary. That's exactly what it's about. I think Paulo Coelho would agree <laughs> that that is an excellent summary of the main idea. It's about going inside, looking inside to find uh, a life that gives you purpose, meaning, right? Not at a, just a basic level, but at the deepest soul or spiritual level. You know, your mission, your deep purpose. That's exactly what this book is about. Uh, Rafikul says, good evening, my great coach. This is my first time joining live. Welcome. By following your methods, my English is improving radically. I am getting confidence super quickly. I listen to your show daily as you recommend. Incredible way to learn English. Well, thank you very much. Okay, this is a nice, another comment from Ong. Uh, sometimes we are book smart and life stupid at the same time. Oh, many people. <laughs> this is a modern disease, right? And, uh, I think our education system creates this. We have a, a, an an, a kind of globalist, international education system that creates exactly this kind of problem. Book smart and life stupid. Sometimes not even book smart. We need to get red pills in real life. We never forget and we become better people. That's right. At that point, the books we read become sensible. They become understandable. Books plus real life experience is the best. Yes, exactly. The truth is this. Look, there are many great books. In fact, especially with great books, truly great books, very deep meaningful books you will not understand and appreciate them much until you have that life experience they're hard to understand if you don't have life i'll give you a good example someone recently mentioned the old man and the sea hemingway great story kind of a short book the old man and the sea now, it's very common, very, 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 very common for young people, me too, <laughs> when I was younger, to read that story. And this is a story that, um, uh, you know, that helped Hemingway get the um, Nobel Prize for Literature. Or is it Pulitzer Prize? I can't remember, actually. Maybe it was Pulitzer Prize. Anyway, one of those big prizes for writing. Uh, it's recognized many, 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 many people in many countries um, since it was written have recognized if, uh, this is a powerful, meaningful story. So there's something in that story that's meaningful and deep, right? But, but very common for young people especially um, to read the story and think, this is boring. I don't understand. Why is this story famous? What? I don't get it. Nothing happens. This guy goes out. He, tr he catches a fish. He tries to bring the fish back. And a shark eats the fish. And, uh, you know, kind of he has a bad day fishing. The end. What's, I don't get why. What's so deep? I don't understand. Right? Why don't they understand? Because they don't have the life experience to understand the deeper message of that story. Now, Hemingway, great writers. Quelio is a good writer. He's a good writer. But Hemingway was a great writer. Good writers are usually more direct with these kind of messages. The alchemist, all of these spiritual messages are very open, very, very, very direct. 
He's telling you exactly what he wants you to think. You know, he's telling you his message very directly. But gr uh, many, I'd say usually great writers like Hemingway, they don't want to tell you directly. They want you to find that message yourself. And they want you to, um, they don't want you to understand it exactly the same. They want you to find the message in the story, but also to connect the message to your life. Right? So that you have your own version, so that the story will mean something a little different to each person. That's what the great ones do, and that's why Hemingway was great. And so, to understand the more indirect, we'd say subtle, S-U-B-T-L-E, S-U-B-T-L-E, subtle, the more subtle, the more indirect messages, deep messages of Old Man and the Sea, you need life experience, right? It's about an old man. It's about an old man who's been living this life for a long time, who's had many hard, he's had a hard, tough life. And then this day of fishing he has is very, very hard and tough. And he, it's just everything, you know, he seems to have this great good luck. And then every, after that, it's bad luck and bad luck and fighting and struggle. And if you in your life, if you have a lot of life experience and you've had pain in your life and you've had difficult struggles and problems in your life and you've had uh, good things happen, but then you've had good luck, but then it just seems to get harder and harder and worse and worse. And then you go through all of this. And if in your life you've had hard, hard experiences, but somehow the hard experiences were still good and beautiful and you still appreciate them if you have that in your life then you read the book old man in the sea you're going to love that book you're going to love that book because that book describes those experiences those kind of experiences and you will understand them from your own life and you will see the beauty of the writing if on the other hand you're young you've had an easy life um it just seems like a boring story about an old man fishing. You don't, you don't see any of the messages. You don't get it. Walden, one of my favorite books, American writer, uh, Henry David Thoreau, same problem. I read it when I was uh, young in high school. I like, what? When this is kind of boring. I don't understand. What's, why is this book great? Some guy goes out into the woods, into the forest by himself. He builds a house and he lives in it. It seems pretty boring. Nobody, no wars, no fighting, no excitement, no adventure, <laughs> right? I had no idea. Now I read it, or actually even, you know, 10 years later when I read it, ah, it, it seems so much more powerful. I, I understood so many more of the messages. And if I read it again now, even more, right? The book gets better as I get older. This happens with great books, Shakespeare, um, great spiritual books too. You know, the Upanishads, the Dhammapada, um, uh, some you know really old books like the Iliad, the Iliad and the Odyssey. I think I remember reading the Odyssey in high school also, and I just thought, eh, it was okay. There's a few adventure parts in it, some little bit of fighting. It's kind of cool. Uh, as a kid, I kind of remember it, but nothing special. I just thought, well, nothing great about this. I read it last year again, and uh, wow, I loved it. I loved it, loved it, because I could find so much deeper meaning because I have more life experience now. So Aung's comment is very good. The life experience is the most important. Coelho gives us the same message. He shows us with Santiago that Santiago is about 90% life experience. He does read a little bit. He reads some books about alchemy. He likes reading when he's back in Spain, even as a shepherd. So he does do some reading, but most of his learning is from real life. Watching, looking, meditating, failing, pro solving problems right? Meeting people. That's most of his learning and then a little bit of book learning. So I think Coelho is telling us that's probably the best way. I think he's right. 
Vanderlei says hi from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Another Brazilian. Okay. Aung says we must have another comment about meditation. Yes, meditation's fantastic. However you decide to do that. Okay, Safi has a good question. I explained this in an audio podcast, Safi, so I'm not going to go, I'm not going to talk about it for a long time because I already did this. Go get my audio podcast. Look at uh, my, my shows from this week. I think the last four or five shows. I talked, I did a long one, a long show about this exact question, intuition and thinking. What's the difference between normal thinking and intuition? The short summary is thinking is what is kind of noisy, right? It's that noisy talking in your mind, talking, talking, talking. It's very verbal words, right? Talk, 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 talk in your mind. That's thinking. That's what we do most of the time. What's the difference? What's intuition? Intuition is when your mind becomes quiet. It's the opposite. It's not talking, it's listening. It's when you let your mind become quiet and you listen and you watch, and you observe. It's meditation again. This is what the alchemist tells Santiago. Follow your heart. How do I do that? By listening to it. Not talking to it. Listening. So it's a process of quieting your mind. Thinking is noisy inside your mind, right? It feels like there's a lot of talking and words in your mind and images. and It's a noisy mind when you're thinking. But Intuition is quiet. So it's when you calm, 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 calm and quiet your mind, very calm and quiet, and you listen and you listen. And that's when some of those deep, the deepest thoughts, the deepest ideas, the deepest dreams, that's when you'll finally hear them and notice them. You don't notice them when you're thinking because your mind's too loud. You've got to quiet your mind to find your intuition. Hope that helps. Mm, oh, okay. This is a good question. It's an interesting question. I don't know if I have an answer, but uh, Seslova says... In your opinion, why is this book, book called The Alchemist? Uh, I'm just going, going to guess. I don't know exactly. But I think Coelho, Coelho studied, and I think he is interested in um, this kind of alchemy, um, kind of, kind of more some of the older or more hidden um, spiritual teachings, European and somewhat also Arabic, and even going back to Egypt maybe. I think that's, I think he's interested in that, and I think that's why he uses this in his story because it's kind of a way to make an adventure story that also has a, spiritual meaning because you know again what is the point of alchemy it's to find the spiritual in the material right to find the spiritual power in the everyday normal material physical world that's supposedly was i don't know i'm not an expert on the alchemist but supposedly that's that was the deep purpose of the alchemist and that's the deepest message of his book right? Is that that's what really we're all doing. I think that's what he's saying, not only about Santiago. I think the deepest message of the book is that this is our journey, all of us. We all have a different way to do this, but really we all have the same journey, which is to find the spiritual in the physical, right? In this normal world we're living, this normal life we're living, to find the spiritual, to find God, whatever word, the Tao, Nirvana, Brahman, whatever word you want to use, doesn't matter. 
uh, Vishnu, hey Vishnu. Um, yeah, grace is a blessing or gift or talent from the Almighty or God, or, right? Whatever word we use. That's right. Exactly right. Now, the Christians actually, um, the Christians have uh, even talked about grace and they had different kinds of grace. Like they had something called a gratuitous grace, a free grace, which is like a free gift from God. Uh, 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 it's basically a, um, a blessing that you really don't deserve. You did nothing to deserve it. Just God gives it to you. Um, and then there are other kinds of graces that you earn, right? You do it by being a good person, by living a very good life, and then you sort of can connect with that. Okay, good. Ramesh, with a nice long comment. Let's read this. When a person wins the first time, he craves more victory and then much more. Finally, it becomes a habit and ultimately becomes his destination. The desire of success is so sharp, it continuously increases the appetite of success. Yeah. The boy la loudly laughed next to the pyramid because he understood that the treasure he found digging the pyramid was just personal property. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't mention the laughter. It's a good point. It's, it's maybe the final little piece, little piece of learning he needed to get all the way there, dig in the hole, and realize it's just, it's not, it's not even here. <laughs> it's not even here, right? I mean, he still got the gold in the end, which is nice. But Ramesh makes a very good point. This is the problem with the winning is everything uh, mentality, the, that idea. The problem with it is, number one, winning is just an instant. It's just this much time, right? And then it's gone. Poof, it's gone, right? Uh, any sports team, you know this, the champions. Okay, let's say, I don't know uh, who won the championship in uh, NFL last year, American football. Uh, Eagles, I think. All right, let's say the Philadelphia Eagles. Last last year, they won the championship game in America. They're, they're American champions, champions of the whole country. So, yay, they won the Super Bowl. Yay. What happens? Well, it, that they feel fantastic for one day. Maybe they feel fantastic for a few months. But then in the summer, what happens? Back to practice. The new season starts. All that's gone now. Now they got to do it again. Now they got to practice and train again because they have a new season, new games. They're going to have to fight and fight and fight and fight. Probably they will not be champions again this year. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't watched. I don't know how they're doing this year, but uh, almost never. They almost never repeat in the NFL. So the moment of winning is very short compared to the total time practicing, training, playing regular games, right? That's most of the time is everything else. The moment of winning the Super Bowl, right? The championship game, it's, it's only one day and then it's gone. So just to focus everything on the one day, you're missing everything else. You're missing the other 99% all of the other time. And that's why other great coaches... My favorite coach, uh, John Wooden, was a basketball coach, college basketball coach. He was also very successful, but he had the opposite idea. How you play the game is important. He always told his players, I don't care if you win or lose. I don't care. I will not yell at you if you lose. He said, I care how you play. I want to see you do your best. If I see you are doing your best, you are trying hard, you have a lot of heart playing with all your heart, working together, that you practicing very hard. You have great discipline. If you do all of that and you still lose, I will be happy. He says, sometimes the other team, they're just better. Sometimes the other players, the other team, they are better than us. We can't control that. We only control how we play. We do our best. We do the best we can, right? Now, John Wooden, even more, he was a spiritual person, very spiritual. He was Christian. 
And he also told his players, it's not enough just to play basketball well. You have to be a good person. You have to use basketball and the discipline of basketball to become a better person. You must also have discipline in your regular life. You must also practice and train to be a good person, to have emotional discipline, to work hard, to learn constantly in life. So again, he was a college basketball coach. If one of his players did something bad, you know, like in, in real life, they stole something or they broke the law, he, he would not let them play. Even if it was his best player, they could not play. Because again, and so he really believed this. He didn't just say, talk about it. He really believed how you play, it's how you live is most important, not the little goal, not the one goal. Because the truth is sometimes, sometimes you get the goal, sometimes you don't. In this story with Santiago, what if he never got the gold treasure? What if he never got it? What if he went to Spain and somebody already got it? It was gone. No, he, he never got the box of gold. Would that be a huge failure for him? I don't think so. No, of course not. Because the journey already gave him everything. He already found that grace. He found Fatima. He found the, the, the skill and the practical skills of business, right? At the crystal shop, the tea shop. He met all those wonderful people. He learned alchemy. He met the alchemist. I mean, he had these amazing experiences. He became a wise and good and strong person. I mean, honestly, by the end, he really doesn't even need the gold. It's just a little extra for him. So the goal, by the end, the goal was not even necessary. But he needed it in the beginning, right? In the beginning, he didn't know about any of this stuff. He, so if he dreamed about, you know, connecting to God or if he dreamed about other things, maybe he, he would have said, oh, that's crazy. But dreaming of gold, ah, oh, that got his attention, right? Because at that time, he's just a young guy. And so gold seemed very motivating. So the, that goal, you know, was kind of like, you know, attracted him to go on the journey. But really, after, by the end, the gold was not even necessary. Okay, a couple more. Let's see how we do. An hour and a half. I think it's almost time. We have finished another book, everybody. Okay, Fash Fashid has a nice, another nice comment I want to mention because it's important. I conclude that in order to reach a superior level of wisdom, one has to lose or spend or pay for a few things. Yeah. The time is the dominant thing. Time. You need time. Time spent to lead a person to a bright and strong faith. Yeah. Uh, again, we have a phrase in English. Um, pay your dues. You must pay your dues. It means pay the price. If you want something uh, powerful, you want something meaningful, you want something important, you, you don't get it free. You've got to pay your dues. Now, um, musicians talk about this. Artists in general talk about this. So, for example, um, a musician will say, you, 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 you've got to pay your dues. You know? You've got to um, you know, be poor and maybe play your music in some tiny little bars, right? And you're not getting any money. But you need to do that to learn how to be a good performer. You have to have those difficult situations. They make you a better performer, right? If you just become famous and rich immediately, you don't, get, you don't learn the skills. Um, comedians talk about this, paying your dues, why it's important, right? The stand-up guys, they use a mic, right? And they stand in front of a stage. And a lot of these guys, they tell stories about their early days, paying their dues, paying the price. And how they talk about, you know, terrible jobs, right? Where they have to stand up and talk to drunk people. They, they talk to small groups. 
nobody's laughing or people are yelling at them you suck you're terrible right they have all these really 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 hard situations in the beginning but they say that those situations are important because that's how they learn to handle the difficult situations to be, to get better because they're in these situations again and again at the beginning so then later if somebody yells something right Sometimes this happens with comedians. Somebody in the audience will yell, like insult them. You suck. But the good comedians, they will immediately say something back to that person in the audience. Something funny that's also insulting, right? They will, and they're really good at it. And, it get, and then everybody starts laughing and the comedian wins, right? The professional wins. Well, how do they learn how to do that? They learn by paying their dues, right? By being in those tough, hard situations again and again and again and again. So when they finally become famous, they're ready. They're really, really good. If you don't pay your dues, if you get suddenly get money, if you suddenly become famous, you're not ready. Those are the people who suffer a lot. Right? Maybe for one year or two years, everything seems great. They've got a lot of money. They're famous. But then usually these are the people who become addicts, who become alcoholics, who they're at the top and suddenly, boom, their whole career just disappears, right? Because they did not pay their dues. Okay, guys. Whew. I think that's it. I'll do this one last comment, and then we are finished with The Alchemist. I'll think of the next book. What's the next book? I think I might do a nonfiction book next. We're kind of alternating, right? We did, um, our first one was fiction, Animal Farm. Then we did uh, nonfiction, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now we're doing fiction again. So maybe, again, I'll do nonfiction next. We can go back and forth. Fiction, nonfiction, fiction, nonfiction. Saksith with our last comment. I don't care whether you win or not. I care how you play. You do your best or not. Exactly. That's right. It's how you live, right? Life is not about winning or losing in the end about how you live it's the whole thing it's not just this one moment i think i i you know i thought of this example let's imagine somebody is uh fat very fat unhealthy uh, 150 kilograms 300 pounds so they're really unhealthy really fat and they're unhealthy and they're eating junk and they're sick they have diabetes they, they just uh they can't they just sit in a chair all day and they they have pain in their body they're so unhappy. And they decide, oh, I'm oh, they have a kind of a dream. Maybe they see something, something on TV or they read a book or, and they just, and they about marathon. Some guy runs a marathon. He lost a bunch of weight and he ran a marathon. And they, for some reason, they say, I'm going to do that. In two years, I will run a marathon. So now they have a goal. A very specific goal. They have a date two years from now and a very specific goal. A marathon, 26 miles, 26.2, I think. And so what do they do? Over the next two years, what do they do? Well, they have to change, right? They have to start using a lot of discipline. They change their eating. They start eating healthier foods, healthier foods, healthier foods, cutting the junk food, cutting the junk food. They have to start exercising first, just walking a little bit, then walking a little more, then a little more, maybe lifting weights a little bit, maybe stretching a little bit, little by little more and more and more and more. They keep going, they keep going, they start losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, losing weight, getting stronger, getting healthier. And finally, two years, two years later, two years later, they're thin, they look like me, oh, oh. <laughs> right? They're not fat anymore. They have good energy, they're eating well, they're healthy, they have more energy. Their body feels fantastic. They're completely different now, two years later. And they go, and they go to the race, the marathon race, the big goal, and they enter the race, and they start running. Yes, oh, I did it, I did it. And then, in the middle, mile number 13, 
their knee, their leg, right? Their knee. They get a pain in their knee. Ah, really bad pain in their knee. It's really painful. Something's wrong. They try to keep going. They try to keep running, and the pain gets worse and worse. More and more pain. The leg starts to get, we say, swelling. It means it gets bigger, right? Because kind of water and blood is going into it. It's getting bigger and bigger. The pain is terrible. They have to stop. They, they must quit. They must stop, right? Because they're going to hurt themselves very badly. They have no choice. They must stop in the middle. And so then you think, you ask, did they fail? Should they cry and say, I failed my goal. It's terrible. Of course not. That's ridiculous, right? Because the goal at that point, that goal is just extra. Running the, the race is just extra because the deeper goal, the real goal was to be healthy, to lose the weight, to feel better, to be active. They did all of that. They're thin, they're energetic, they're healthy, and they ran 13 miles. They didn't run 26. Is that important, really? No. They didn't win, right? They didn't get the goal, but they got the purpose. They achieved the purpose, the deeper purpose they got. Their whole life is different now. The race, eh, if they run the race and they finish, of course, it's a nice feeling. But if they fail to run the race, it's not a problem. It's not a big deal. That's how you should think about goals in life. Okay? They are useful. Their goals are useful to get us moving in a direction sometimes because it seems exciting. It seems interesting. So it can kind of give us some motivation to get moving. That's great. But, but never forget that there's usually a more important purpose under the goal or behind the goal or inside the goal, right? So don't get too focused on just winning, 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 success, 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 the goal, goal, goal. Don't focus too much on that and forget the more meaningful purpose. Because many times, once you achieve the purpose, once you get the purpose, ah, the goal, you can just relax about the goal. All right, guys, thank you so much. Very much enjoyed our comments, our discussions. This was a very interesting book. This was a fun book to do. I enjoyed it. I think we had some very interesting comments and questions, especially from you, uh, the Effortless English family, and during the live shows. I enjoyed this one a lot because of that more than anything. You really helped me think more deeply about this book, offered some very interesting ideas and thoughts about it. And I think we... We really found some great messages in this book. As I said, our next book, we're going to probably do a nonfiction book, so something very practical. Sorry, kind of alternating. The nonfiction, I mean, strangely, the fiction often has sort of more deep messages, philosophical messages, in this case, spiritual messages. And then the nonfiction often is very practical stuff, more material maybe, but uh, it's a nice to have the combination. They're both useful. It's good to have that balance sometimes. So I'll think more about uh, a good nonfiction book. I already have some suggestions from you. And uh, we'll wait a couple weeks. And then we'll do another one. Until then, lots of love to you. Thank you so much, all those of you who have joined me during the live shows. Appreciate it. And of course, to everyone who listens uh, to the recordings as well. All right. I'll see you the next show. Contact me on Gab and Twitter and everywhere else, AJ Hogue, A-J-H-O-G-E. Lots of love to you. As always, join my VIP program. Commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Speak powerfully, speak effortlessly, speak fluently. Join today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. That's EffortlessEnglishClub.com dot com.